welcome to St. Martin in the Fields. We've come together to remember and to celebrate a man of many words, of voracious intelligence, extravagant interests, passionate commitments, sharp tongue, and restless heart. We're going to try, in his words, our words, and sung words, to encompass the immense impact his life had on the lives of countless others. And we're going to weave together the disparate chords of his life into a fresh melody as we find a way to say goodbye. We remain standing to pray. Bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven to enter into that gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling but one equal light, no noise nor silence but one equal music, no fears nor hopes but one equal possession. No ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity. In the habitations of thy majesty and glory, world without end. Amen. Amen.
you're not a melancholic Scot? Um, I don't think I'd call myself melancholic at all, no. Do you get gloomy? Not often. Or pessimistic? Uh, no, I've got the goofy optimism of the Enlightenment. I mean, I'm it's a primitive Enlightenment man, the sort of silly ass who was born in about 1772, who said, we're all perfectible. Uh, we will continue with a uh, reading from an interview by Magnus Linklater of Norman in The Times in March 2017. When Norman Stone touched down in Ankara 22 years ago, he knew at once that it was his kind of place. As he walked through the airport, he saw six policemen smoking away beneath a sign saying, no smoking. <laughs> as a veteran policeman, as a veteran smoker with a long history of challenging convention, Professor Stone felt an immediate bond Turkey has been his home ever since. Living in exile, or, or living abroad rather, is a decision this Glasgow-born, Cambridge-educated historian has never regretted. A few weeks after arriving, he was asked why he was the only foreigner who never complained about Ankara. I said, you have to understand, I think this is my best line, actually, that in the depth of my being, I'm a Scotsman, and I feel entirely at home in an enlightenment that has failed. <laughs> it's, it's a typical stone comment, succeeding dexterously in insulting two countries at once. <laughs> As much. His relationship with Scotland has always been a fraught one, and now, as his final year at Bill Kent University in Ankara comes to an end, he has no intention of returning home. At home, he attended Glasgow Academy, he is an honorary governor, on a scholarship for the children of deceased servicemen. His father had been killed in the war, and he went on to become a professor of modern history at Oxford. In the 1980s and 1990s, he was a regular in newspaper columns and on the BBC. A Scot who admires Margaret Thatcher, he was a foreign policy advisor on Europe as well as an occasional speechwriter. He refers to the United Kingdom as England, thinks the best thing that happened in the 18th century was the abolition of Scotland, and is no more likely to return to his native country than Nicola Sturgeon is to put down roots in Istanbul. <laughs> Not only is Scotland too wet for his liking, talk of independence appalls him. What would he do if there was a yes vote in a future referendum? I think I should want to take Haitian citizenship, he explodes. I disapprove so strongly of all that stuff. It would be inconceivable that Scotland could be independent. I'd hate the idea. I first met Norman, I now realise, 39 years ago, on the 13th of October, 1980. I was in my first term at Trinity College, Cambridge, and he was my first supervisor. My director of studies uh, told me I should go and see Norman, and he said that I would find him, and he stroked his chin, stimulating. For some reason, Norman's rooms were not in the main body of the college, but quite a long way away in the seclusion of the Trinity Fellows Garden. It was 11 a.m. when I climbed to the top of the stairs and knocked on the door. There was no answer. I waited and then I knocked again. This time, the door opened, and there, wearing the shortest dressing gown since Sean Connery in Doctor No, <laughs> was Norman, a glass of scotch in one hand, a cigarette in the other. He looked at me in surprise, and then dawning comprehension. Well, you'd better come in then. At least, that is what I thought he said, as he was speaking in a Slavonic language which I think was probably Polish, but it could have been Czech or Serbo-Croatian. Norman had no patience with the linguistic limitations of most of his students. I remember him telling me that his top tip for finals 
was to throw in a few quotes in Hungarian. The examiners won't understand, of course, but they'll be impressed. As so often, Norman was right. A little Hungarian can go a long way. The supervision began, me keeping my eyes firmly on Norman's face on account of the dressing gown. He offered me a drink. Uh, needless to say, sherry was not on offer. It was whiskey, vodka, or, with a slight pause, white wine. I took the whiskey. But then Norman started to talk, in English, thank goodness, about the Counter-Reformation and how the Jesuits had been the equivalent of Louis B. Mayer, luring the punters back into their churches with the spectacle of Baroque art. From there, we went on to the polonization of Russia and how the Jews of Nuremberg were the goodest of good eggs. It was a cornucopia of delights. And I remember I, I loved him describing his PhD, PhD students Orlando Figes among them as mushrooms nestling at the foot of a great oak. <laughs> for a girl for whom history had been a carefully balanced medley of on the one hand and however and in conclusion and I have to admit woefully Anglo-centric, Norman's European perspective, his glorious generalizations, his vivid Woodhousean style was quite literally an epiphany. History taught by Norman was never worthy. It was gossipy, it had goodies and baddies, and it was all about narrative. And as someone who now earns her living writing historical drama, I have a lot to thank Norman for. I certainly wrote the only essays I can still remember for him. But as um, it wouldn't be fair to Norman not to include a few warts. He liked warts and all, um, so I won't be completely hagiographic. Um, his interest in me, I should, I should say, was not purely intellectual. He, he came to my flat for dinner once. It was, it was a dinner party, and um, in the middle of lasagna, he looked at me and said... I'm so struck by your profile. And then he began to sing the Madamina area from Don Giovanni. It was, um, it was a very good move, so good, in fact, that I, I suspected it might have been used before. <laughs> and, but, unlike some other um, teachers, uh, he, was never, he was never physical with his admiration. He may have thought I was crazy for refusing him, but he did understand the concept of no. And he didn't take it personally. As he said to me later, all cats are grey in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> of course, now such behaviour would be beyond the pale. But I have to say I'm very grateful for the education I received from Norman. I was educated in, in, in every sense. The last time I saw him, I was writing a novel about the Empress Elizabeth of Austria. Frightful woman, Norman said. And we sat up until four in the morning discussing the death wish of the Wittelsbachs and the lonely camp bed, camp bed of the Emperor Franz Joseph. He wrote to me later to say that he had read the book and thought I had done the frightful woman justice and no review has ever been more treasured. And, as we say in Hungarian, ish iljet nem habos torta. Life isn't a piece of cake, but with Norman, it was sacca torta all the way.
As we were hearing, Norman could be rather ambiguous about his Scottishness and would sometimes tease us with that terrible old Samuel Johnson notion that the noblest prospect that a Scotchman ever sees is the high road that leads him to England. But deep down, Norman took a fierce pride in his Glasgow roots. He did love Scotland and he loved the writing of Thomas Babington Macaulay. This passage comes a little ironically from Macaulay's history of England, perhaps logically, where Macaulay describes Scottish Highlanders in the following terms. An enlightened and dispassionate observer would have found in the characters and manners of this rude people something which might well excite admiration and a good hope. Their intense attachment to their own tribe and to their own patriarch, though politically a great evil, partook of the, of the nature of virtue. The sentiment was misdirected and ill-regulated, but still it was heroic. There must be some elevation of soul in a man who loves the society of which he is a member and the leader whom he follows with a love stronger than the love of life. It was true that the Highlander had few scruples about shedding the blood of an enemy, but it was not less true that he had high notions of the duty of observing faith to allies and hospitality to guests. It was also true that his predatory habits were most pernicious to the Commonwealth, but when he drove before him the herds of lowland farmers up the pass which led to his native glen, he no more considered himself a thief than the Raleighs and the Drakes considered themselves as thieves when they divided the cargoes of Spanish galleons. He was a warrior seizing lawful prize of war that if he was caught robbing on such principles, he should be punished with the utmost rigor of the law was perfectly just. But it was not just to class him morally with the pickpockets who infested Drury Lane Theater or the highwaymen who stopped coaches on Black Heath. His inordinate pride of birth and his contempt for labor and trade were indeed great weaknesses and had done far more than the inclemency of the air and the sterility of the soil to keep his country poor and rude. Yet even here there was some compensation. As there was no other part of the island where men, sordidly clothed, lodged, and fed, indulged themselves to such a degree in the idle, sauntering habits of an aristocracy, so there was no other part of the island where such men had, in such degree, the better qualities of an aristocracy, grace and dignity of manner, self-respect, and that noble sensibility which makes dishonor more terrible than death. A gentleman of this sort, whose clothes were begrimed with the accumulated filth of years, and whose hovel smelt worse than an English hogsty, would often do the honors of that hovel with a lofty courtesy worthy of the splendid circle of Versailles. No Enemies by Charles Mackay. You have no enemies, you say? Alas, my friend, the boast is poor. He who has mingled in the fray of duty that the brave endure must have made foes. If you have none, small is the work that you have done. You've hit no traitor on the hip. You've dashed no cup from perjured lip. You've never turned the wrong to right. You've been a coward in the fight. I first met Norman at three o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday the 13th of October 1982. He was my history supervisor at Keyes and was supposed to be teaching me about the French Revolution. The reason that I can be so exact about it is because I kept a diary that Michaelmas term and I wrote that day he talked about himself, his books, other dons, almost everything except the French Revolution. I don't mind, but I may have to revise my ideas about getting a first. <laughs> I thought that the best way to catch up on the French Revolution would be to attend Norman's lectures on the subject at the Sidgwick site. Went to Norman Stone's lecture at noon, records my diary. Very funny and instructive, but he decides to talk about Jewish intellectuals in fin de siècle Vienna. 
The extraordinary thing about Norman's lectures was that they got more popular as the term went on, standing room only at one point, despite his regularly not lecturing on the topic advertised, or indeed on any in the curriculum. In one diary entry, I write, Dr. Stone didn't turn up for his lecture today, but sent an acolyte instead. The acolyte, and if you're in the congregation today, apologies for the way I refer to you, um, did at least lecture on the French Revolution. Of course, I'd known and heard of um, Norman as soon as I went up to Keyes. It was said that in one of his exams, his Cambridge entry paper, uh, perhaps, or even perhaps his finals, he'd answered a question on Germany in the 1848 revolutions. Uh, he'd written about the Duchy of Baden-Württemberg-Strelitz and how the liberal university students there had risen up in early March after hearing of the fall of Louis-Philippe in Paris in late February, how the workers had made common cause with them and thrown up barricades in the capital, how the provisional government had passed liberal measures, but it had all ended badly when the re reactionary duke had sent in the army and re-established control in early 1849. It was a brilliant paper. Norman got top marks. Even though baden württemberg Strelitz turned out to be a complete figment of his imagination. <laughs> Wednesday the 7th of November, 1982, cycled over to Grange Road and found Dr. Stone in his dressing gown looking ashen and drawn as ever. Um, he read my essay and after chatting for an hour or so I left. Although it seemed like mere chatting at the time, I now realise that in that glorious... Cambridge autumn of 37 years ago now, Norman, despite his Olympian hangovers, was in fact infusing me with a love of history that's never left me, as he did for so many of his pupils. He made history matter. As he put it in his Sunday Times article about the famous Chequers meeting on German reunification, history exists as an academic subject outside museums only because people think it could give answers to the questions of this kind. Norman made history relevant, even urgent, and the way he talked about it in those one-on-one -on -one supervisions made you feel that Bismarck or Metternich or Napoleon III could be in the next door room. Back to my diary. Went to a hilarious stone lecture on Weber where he spoke for an hour without notes. Thursday the 5th of November, a wonderful supervision with Norman Stone who gave me two vast whiskies. He spoke about the time the Czech government arrested him for trying to smuggle a dissident out of the country. He would extend essay dates without ever asking why, um, asked me to read out a, an essay in a whisper, because hangovers can last until noon. Uh, and on the 29th of November 1982, I noticed that Norman, we were obviously on uh, first, tame, uh, first name terms by then, says not to do any more work this term. How could one not fall in thrall to a man like that? <laughs> and then there were the jokes. There's nothing inevitable in history, he once told me, uh, so historians should never use the word inevitable, except for German counterattack. <laughs> his uh, capacity to find humor in everything, his eagerness to poke fun at orthodoxies of all kinds, his extraordinary uh, recall, his capacity for languages. Above, above all, his evident love of the subject he taught was utterly captivating for a 19-year-old boy. It made history seem important and even exciting. When I started writing history books 30 years ago, I realized that I wanted Norman's approbation far more than good reviews or literary prizes or book sales. Norman's capacity to link current affairs to the past in an arresting, unexpected way made editors want to hire historians to comment on public affairs, something that several of us in this congregation have greatly benefited from. He was the most influential historian in the media in the half century between AJP Taylor and the current group of Neil Ferguson, Simon Sharma, um, David Starkey and Anthony Beaver. His willingness to take on orthodoxies made him enemies, of course. He vocally supported Margaret Thatcher at Cambridge and later Oxford after all. As we know, the collective noun for historians is a malice. Um, although the sheer number of historians paying tribute here today might question that, Norman's obituary in The Guardian, or should I say the blatant character assassination in The Guardian posing as an obituary, certainly doesn't. Although his enemies rarely took uh, Norman on when he was alive, fearful of his magnificently coruscating ire, once he was safely dead it was a different matter. No one who knew Norman recognised anything in The Guardian's account of him.
Under normal circumstances, an article by a former Regis Professor of History at Cambridge would be worthy of serious consideration. But as the next effusion from the same pen was an article likening Boris Johnson's recent prorogation of Parliament to Adolf Hitler's suspension of civil liberties after the Reichstag fire, I think we can safely consign the obituary to the ravings of a bitter and perhaps jealous rival historian who has lost all sense of proportion. It was an attempt to diminish Norman in the eyes of posterity, but in fact, all its transparent spite managed to achieve was to diminish the the author himself in the eyes of his contemporaries. Mention of Margaret Thatcher reminds me of the time that Norman, Robin Burley and I were invited to Taipei as part of her wider entourage on her visit to Taiwan in August 1992, less than two years after her fall. On the first night there, she and Dennis and Sir Julian Seymour, her chief of staff, kindly invited us up to the presidential suite for a whiskey nightcap, which, frankly, Norman did not at all need uh, at that (laughs) stage of the evening. We all sat around a vast, sharp-edged, solid marble coffee table as we chatted, or at least we heard Norman's views of John Major, Uh, which are not fit for repetition in a house of God. When the time came for us all to go to bed, Norman stood up and promptly keeled over head first, his forehead missing the corner of the table by less than an inch. As Dennis and, and Sir Julian helped him to his extremely unsteady feet, Lady Thatcher remarked, poor Norman seems to be suffering from jet lag. (laughs) It was all the better, of course, coming from someone who didn't know what jet lag was. <laughs> we each of us have our favourite books of Norman's. There's the Virtuoso Scholarship of the Eastern Front and uh, Europe Transformed, the wit and insights of his biography of Hitler, the short histories of the two world wars and of Turkey and Hungary, the prescience of Czechoslovakia at the crossroads. My own favourite is The Atlantic and, his enemies, and Its Enemies, which was subtitled A Personal History of the Cold War, and which was indeed very personal. A creed occur um, that anything as stupid and evil as communism could have blighted the lives of so many people for so long. It's a profoundly moral work and a brave one, too, for naming the names of the people in the West whose appeasement elongated the pain and the misery. Goodbye, Norman, and thank you for inspiring us with your genius for teaching, for writing, for courage, and above all, for friendship.
Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 11, a piece with special meaning to, for Norman. It was written around 1970 BC. To everything there is a season, and a time to every person, purpose under the sun, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboureth? I have seen the travel which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from beginning to end. Uh just over 20 years ago, I had the idea of writing a novel about a historian who goes in search of the lost notebooks of Joseph Stalin. There was only one historian I could think of, colorful enough to put in a novel, and that was Norman. A lesser man might have sued me, <laughs> but Norman liked the joke, and he liked it even more when he was played in the screen version by Daniel Craig. So here he is, an archangel, renamed Fluke Kelso, waking with a hangover, perish the thought, in the Ukraina Hotel, Moscow. Kelso jerked awake and cracked his head on the protruding lip of the bath. He groaned and rolled onto his back, dabbing at his skull for signs of blood. He was sure he felt some tacky liquid, but when he brought his fingers up close to his eyes and squinted at them, they were clean. As always, even now, even as he lay sprawled on the floor of a Moscow bathroom, there was a part of him that remained mercilessly sober, like the wounded captain on the bridge of a stricken ship, calling calmly through the smoke of battle for damage assessments. This was the part of him which concluded that, bad as he felt, he had, amazingly, sometimes felt worse. <laughs> and this was the part of him that also heard, beyond the dusty thump of his pulse, the creak of a footstep and the click of a door being quietly closed. Kelso set his jaw and rose by force of will through all the stages of human evolution. <laughs> From the slime of the floor to his hands and knees, to a kind of shuffling simian crouch and propelled himself into the empty bathroom. Gray light seeped through the orange curtains and lit the detritus of the night. The sour reek of spilled booze and stale smoke made his stomach coil. Still, and there was heroism as well as desperation in the effort, he headed for the door. Outside, the weather had worsened. It was trying to snow. Tiny flakes as hard as grit came whipping across the wide concourse and spattered his face and hair. At the bottom of the flight of steps, shuddering in a cloud of its own white fumes, was a dilapidated bus waking to take them to the symposium. A battered Byron was how one Sunday newspaper had described him when he resigned his Oxford lectureship and moved to New York. And the description wasn't a bad one. Curly black hair, too long and thick for neatness, a moist, expressive mouth, pale cheeks, and the glow of a certain reputation. If Byron hadn't died on Missolonghi, but had spent the next 10 years drinking whiskey, smoking, staying indoors, and resolutely avoiding all exercise, he too might have come to look a little like Fluke Kelso. <laughs> 
He was wearing what he always wore, a faded black dark blue shirt of heavy cotton with the top button undone, a loosely knotted and vaguely stained dark tie, a black corduroy suit with a black leather belt over which his stomach bulged slightly, red cotton handkerchief in his breast pocket, scuffed boots of brown suede, an old blue raincoat. This was Kelso's uniform, unvaried for 20 years. Boy, Rapava had called him, and the word was both absurd for a middle-aged man and yet oddly accurate, boy. The heater on the bus was going full blast. Nobody was saying much. He sat on his own near the back and rubbed at the wet glass as they jolted up the slip road to join the traffic on the bridge. Beneath them, in the filthy waters of the Musva, a dredger with a crane mounted on its aft deck beat sluggishly upstream. He nearly hadn't come to Russia. That was the joke of it. He knew well enough what it would be like, the bad food, the stale gossip, the sheer bloody tedium of academic life, of more and more being said about less and less. That was one reason why he'd chucked in Oxford and gone to live in New York. But somehow the books he was supposed to write had not quite materialized. And besides, he never could quite resist the lure of Moscow. Even now, sitting on a stale bus in the Wednesday rush hour, he could feel the charge of history beyond the muddy glass, in the dark and renamed streets, the vast apartment blocks, the toppled statues. It was stronger here than anywhere he knew, stronger even than in Berlin. That was, where, that was what always drew him back to Moscow, the way history hung in the air between the blackened buildings, like sulfur after a lightning strike. Before I read my excerpt from the Eastern Front, Rupert asked me to say a few words about the most memorable, if not the most bibulous, encounter um, that Norman and I shared, which was the famous, or some would say infamous, historian seminar at Chequers in March 1990 um, on German unification. We had been summoned to this event by Charles Pohl uh, loosely speaking, the purpose was to persuade Margaret Thatcher that German unification would not necessarily result in a blonde beast being unleashed from its cage and rampaging across Europe. Uh, Norman and I um, traveled together from Oxford, laughing a lot on the way. Six hours later, traveled back, laughing a lot more and drinking a lot more. And it would have remained a really private anecdote if a few weeks later, Charles Pohl's memorandum of this event had not been leaked to the German press. Um, one choice sentence uh, uh, drew particular attention. It read, I quote, some even less flattering attributes were also mentioned as an abiding part of the German character. In alphabetical order, angst, aggressiveness, not sure that's strictly alphabetical, but never mind. <laughs> Angst, aggressiveness, assertiveness, bullying, egotism, inferiority complex, sentimentality. <laughs> As you may imagine, this called a little rumpus in Germany. I think several of those views were actually expressed by Margaret Thatcher herself, um, whose view of Germany was particularly informed by her thorough dislike of Helmut Kohl, and in particular the fact that he had several times out-handbagged her at European summits, something she couldn't forgive. But what was really striking about this event was that the six historians present, having very different personal histories and very different politics, Fritz Stern, Gordon Craig, Hugh Trevor Roper, George Urban, Norman, who was of course a member of the Bruges group, and myself, who certainly wasn't, actually expressed a very similar view to Margaret Thatcher, uh, which was that while there were clearly risks in German unification, actually it was a great chance to have a Germany, a free and democratic Germany, joining the West. And at the end of these five or six hours, Margaret Thatcher sat up, I shall never forget, like a schoolgirl, and said, all right, I've got the message. I'll be very nice to the Germans. <laughs> <laughs>
Whether she actually was is another question. Anyway, this means that I clearly have to read something about Germany. This is from the Eastern Front, which in my own view is probably Norman's finest book, because it combines really deep, rigorous research in an extraordinary range of sources in multiple languages, a, an activity that Norman described memorably as sludge gulping, <laughs> <laughs> and an elegance of style a wit, uh, an eye for the absurd, uh, characteristic of the best of English and indeed Scottish historical writing. I'd forgotten that the book is actually dedicated to J.H. Plum, which I think is significant. The extract I've chosen is about the Battle of Tannenberg, the great battle in East Prussia in August 1914, which raised Hindenburg and Ludendorff to heroic status in the German imagination. The story Norman tells is that actually this was a story of chaos, of confusion, of utter disarray of the Russian forces. It's actually very like Tolstoy's description of the Napoleonic Wars in War and Peace. And um, I'll begin at the end of his description. Samsonov and Zelensky are both the Russian commanders. Samsonov himself rode off towards Willenberg with his chief of staff, a Cossack guard, one map and a compass for the entire group. He is said to have shot himself. Confusion was such that Zelensky himself failed to appreciate what had happened until the 2nd of September. Tannenberg, which on rather dubious grounds gave its name to the battle, was the most spectacular victory of the war and generated a propaganda myth for years to come. East Prussia had been defended seemingly against overwhelming odds. 100,000 men and nearly 400 guns were captured. In practice, the victory was overrated at the time. The Russians recovered and invaded East Prussia again a few weeks later. But what was dangerous to the Germans was the myth that Tannenberg launched. Men supposed, and the version produced by Ludendorff later buttressed their supposition, that Hindenburg and Ludendorff had made a brilliant strategic maneuver leading to a new canai. By the way, it's interesting that writing in the mid-1970s, Norman assumed that the general reader would immediately get the reference to canai, as I'm sure does everyone in this church. <laughs> Hannibal's victory over a uh, vastly superior Roman army in 216 BC. There was something in this, Norman goes on, but it was distorted by exaggeration. The transfer of troops to Samsonov's left was arranged before Ludendorff arrived and formed part of a sensible scheme foreseen some years before. Even this developed as well as it did largely because Francois, a German com commander, disobeyed Ludendorff's instructions. The maneuver that brought two German corps into Samsonov's right flank was certainly Ludendorff's. But that too was calculated as a form of retreat and only chance and a delay turned it into the coup against Samsonov's right flank of the, time of the type eventually attained. The Germans won because they were defenders on whom sense was almost imposed by the layout of the land and the railways and the nature of the task. Tannenberg nonetheless launched a myth of the brilliant strategic coup, a perpetuation of the Napoleonic myth in Eastern Europe, which in the circumstances of 1914 to 1918 was dangerous enough. It was common sense, discipline, decentralization that won Tannenberg. Just the same, Ludendorff discovered from it that he had military genius and found a large number of Germans to agree with him.
Norman's Wisdom and Turkey's Delight by James Cusick. Do historians still matter? Oxford's departing professor of modern history, Norman Stone, surrounded by the self-created chaos that followed the announcement he was leaving, the dreaming spires for Turkish academe, believes that without history it would be as though there were an earth for everything rather than having a live wire somewhere. The electrical metaphor makes perfect sense. But throw, stone, throw in stone himself as the live wire, the enfant terrible, the thorn in Oxford's crown, whose bacchanalian high wire act, an unique form of popularism, has been in media demand since he took over Oxford's history helm in 1984. And there should be mourning that the British historical circus is losing one of his center ring performers. At his home, with the telephone continually ringing, his answering machine spewing out urgent appeals from the Thames to the Bosphorus, an era is ending. He has just written a newspaper article about what is best about Britain. So what did he say? I can't quite remember. I wrote it last night. <laughs> a Sunday newspaper as we speak is being dispatched another epistle from the gospel, according to Stone. Newsnight phones, another part of the BBC has just left. A Turkish journalist wants 10 minutes on the telephone. Stone, aged 55 and looking far better than he should if his reputation is correct, has the ability to laugh amid the fourth estate idolatry. He delivers yet another appropriate quotation, probably translated from his knowledge of eight languages to capture the moment. His appointment to head a Russian-Turkish institute in Ankara will only take him away from Oxford for four months of the year. England is not completely waving goodbye to Professor Stone, so he laughs. Only when your feet are in the syrup should you tell the horse the truth. <laughs> As we speak, more chaos is piling up. A neighbor comes to the door. The family cat, Monty, has been tragically run over by a car. More, more media requests pour in. I think it's time for a drink. Calvados OK? The Dauphin Calvados is fine and warrants a probe into Stone's past record of heavy drinking and the often cited accusation that academe has been partially sacrificed for worship on the altars of Fleet Street and television celebrity. Should there, have been a more, should there have been more mea culpas? Would he, would he have done the things differently? He admits, I have to say, yes, I do recognize myself in these stories, and there were some silly mistakes. He closes his eyes as he remembers one interview he gave to Zoe Heller of The Independent on Sunday. He shrugs. I shouldn't have opened that bottle of wine at 11.30 a.m., that is. For all Stone's excesses and media celebrity, it is too easy to overlook that he's still one of our finest analytical minds in the task of unraveling <clears throat> the meaning, if there is any, of the 20th century. The 1980s, with the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe and with Western Europe desperately trying to reinvent its raison d'etre, placed Stone in the role of historical lifeguard. If you were drowning for meaning, he could throw you assistance. He is still throwing. Like everyone who has spoken so far, I can remember vividly when I first met Norman Stone. In my case, it was at a conference in Poland, shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. This event took place in an agricultural institute outside Warsaw and had a certain surreal quality which you will all realize immensely appealed to Norman. The conference had invited delegates from all over the Central, P Central European nations of the Rust Bucket Soviet Empire, as well as Westerners. It included a Czechoslovak delegation which wore balaclava helmets in the plenary sessions. The Velvet Revolution had not yet taken place and the delegates were worried about being recognized on the platform, although not so much in the bar afterwards. 
the speeches were distinctly at variance with Marxist-Leninist principles, but incongruously, they were delivered from a platform erected under a large confection which urged the agricultural workers of the world to unite. Most of the contributions from the Western delegates must have made little sense to the newly liberated or soon to be liberated Central Europeans, since they tended to focus on the domestic policy arguments then current in the home country of the speakers. The exception to this rule was Norman. Throughout, he displayed a deep understanding of the culture and politics, not only of the Central European nations of the Soviet Empire, but of the Soviet Union itself. It helped, of course, that he seemed to speak most of their languages with a remarkable fluency, and that he took the trouble to read the local newspapers and watch the local television. He was therefore able to develop an enviable feel for what was going on. Most of the bonding at such events notoriously takes place between sessions, and Norman's knowledge, scholarship, and sympathy would anyway have made him by far the most popular delegate with our hosts. However, those things were not really what bound him to them. Rather, it was his charm, his humor, and his ability to talk to them on equal terms, particularly over dinner when much Polish vodka was consumed, with Norman happily taking at least his fair share. Just watching him talking, you could readily understand what a brilliant teacher Norman must have been. Understandably, as we've heard already this afternoon, his pupils were devoted to him, including, I seem to remember, one Dominic Cummings, who I first met with Norman. I wonder what happened to him. <laughs> he had a prodigious memory, and I remember him once running through the names of all the divisional commanders at the Battle of Tannenberg, which Tim has reminded us he was a considerable expert on, in answer merely to a casual question. Uh, the battle, the commanders on both sides, of course. As a result of our Polish interlude, we became friends, and I occasionally stumbled across him abroad as well as in London. For instance, during the course of the fall of the Soviet Union, I once met him in the Arbat by sheer chance late in the afternoon. I had no idea that he was in Moscow, and he seemed, for some reason, to have forgotten where he was lodging. Uh, <laughs> I, I suggested that there might be room for him at the Oktoberskaya Hotel, which was where I was staying at the time. He mentioned that a pupil of his was spending a few days in Moscow by way of R&R &R from Tallinn, uh, where the pupil in question had used extraordinarily unorthodox methods, not repeatable, I think, in church, uh, to gain access to the local KGB archives. It was typical, I thought, of a pupil of Norman's to take R&R &R in Moscow rather than in London or his native Scotland. Anyway, they both came to stay, and at the luncheon the following day, there was rather an ugly tug of war over a bot vodka bottle, uh, which the pupil had substantially consumed, and Norman explained that since he was in statue pupillari, he, Norman, had a moral obligation to finish the rest of the bottle, so uh, as not to uh, in any way offend the moral status of the pupil concerned. Uh, it was on this trip, I think, that Norman nearly got himself into trouble with the French, a nation, of course, for which he had the greatest affection and whose language he spoke fluently and idiomatically. That particular day in Moscow, Norman had been dilating on his admiration for Céline, not as a man, whom he rightly regarded as a contemptible collaborator, but as a writer, and in particular for Céline's D'un Château L'Autre. It was a time, and it turned out to be a brief one, I think, when the Russian National Archives were pretty well open to anyone. And as a scholar, Norman plunged in. Imagine his delight when he found himself looking at the entire Vichy archive, which had followed the Pétain government into exile in Bavaria in three trains when the Germans took over Vichy France in late 1942. This was an episode described by Céline, you'll remember. In 1945, Stalin had demanded the archive's immediate dispatch to Moscow, saving it from immolation by the 3rd and 4th Guards tank armies in Prague Station. <laughs> 
Naturally, the archive contained details of those who had collaborated with the Vichy regime and with the Nazis. I seem to remember, for some reason, the French authorities were not best pleased by Norman's discovery. And it seemed sensible on the whole for him to return to the UK while the matter was duly sorted out. And back at home, Norman was not emotionally attuned to the Oxford bureaucracy, as you will remember. He became a frequent visitor to London. For some years, he stayed with my wife and with me, which was no hard hardship for either of us, as my wife, like me, found Norman delightful and stimulating company. How could she do anything else? As we know, he had a passion for his subject and a gift for conveying that passion as though you were bound to be as interested in it as he was. As a result, you inevitably did become interested. I particularly enjoyed a gesture which consisted of sticking his tongue out while simultaneously shrugging his shoulders and spreading out his hands. <laughs> it was a gesture which Norman applied to any number of people whom he held in contempt. He used it to describe bureaucrats, both academic and governmental, ancient and modern, uh, panjandrums of the Austro-Hungarian Empire particularly, and to mindless and pompous followers of prevailing orthodoxies. I would not be a bit surprised if he hadn't used it when referring to E.H. Carr, whom Norman famously demolished, as many here today will remember. I subsequently discovered from Christine that she deplored Norman staying with me in London as she understood from him that I was a person of dissolute habits who led him into temptation. <laughs> My own wife, in spite of her affection for Norman, had formed curiously exactly the opposite view. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say both ladies compared notes when the Stone family as Rupert will remember, came to stay with us in Dorset. I'm not sure either Norman or I emerged with much credit from that exchange. Sadly, I saw almost nothing of Norman in the years before he died. There was no particular reason for this, but real life has a habit of intervening, as we all know. All my, almost my last luncheon with him was when he very kindly entertained me at the Garrick Club, and I had to leave abruptly when I suddenly remembered, almost too late, that I had to make a statement to their lordships on behalf of the then government. I still remember Norman's parting shot. Why on earth do you waste your time on such ridiculous things? <laughs> we know Norman was a serious scholar, but he was not a solemn one. He loved incongruity. For instance, you'll remember that he opens his gem-like short history of the First World War with an account of the negotiations which led to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. The new Soviet government had no idea how to conduct peace negotiations, so to Norman's delight, it had had to dig out a former Tsarist Foreign Service official, who did know, to teach them how. Perhaps it was his humour that gave him a sense of proportion, for in big questions, he often displayed the greatest of good judgment. We have heard how uh, he famously tried to persuade Mrs. Thatcher to welcome German reunification more wholeheartedly. He also predicted that Russia and Turkey were likely to turn to each other, a view he came to, came to long before it began to happen. Indeed, I seem to remember he wrote about it soon after his translation to Ankara. Rupert, I'm honoured to have been asked to pay tribute to Norman today. It's remarkable and right that already two services have been held abroad, one in Hungary, uh, because he learnt Hungarian from a fellow prisoner on the Czech frontier in a prison cell, and one in Istanbul. But his was a remarkable talent which we should celebrate in his own country as well. What I shall most remember about him is the charm of his company, his humour, his ability to make friends of all ages, his gentleness, and, of course, his lack of pomposity. Like all his friends, I am grateful to have known him and will miss him more than I can say. Our thoughts today, of course, with Rupert, of whom he was tremendously but quietly proud, and the rest of his family. May he rest in peace. Mm -hmm.
I gave my uh, eulogy to Norman in Budapest, so I'm just going to read a passage from The Atlantic and Its Enemies, which is a wonderful book. I've had to abridge it, which was extraordinarily difficult. Do read the whole thing. The scene is Vienna, it's 1964. I spent my evenings more or less kicking a tin past the whores down the Kärtnerstrasse, though there was something to be had from one Christopher Lazar, one-time lover of Klaus Mann and author of one of the greatest book review opening lines ever. John Steinbeck is an inverted Aesop. He uses human beings to illustrate animal truths. <laughs> I had had a landlady from the Banat who used to stir her enormous bloomers in the jam pan and disagreed violently with me as to whether when you cut your fingernails the bits needed to fly off at unpredictable angles. We parted company acrimoniously and through a Croat friend, I found a splendid pair of sisters who looked after me. But it wasn't lively. And the next day's newspapers were sold around 6.30 p.m. when the cafe waiters started looking at their watches. Lazar used to eye them and ask whether perchance they had the newspapers of the day after tomorrow. Budapest even then was more fun if you knew where to go. Norman meets on a train, Andrea, a mysterious Austrian journalist who claims to work for the Daily Express, and her fiancé, Tibor, a Hungarian Jew. She and Tibor had met in that red plush and gold bar in the Grand Hotel on the Margaret Island. It was Ortrud and Telramund. There was money once the West was reached. They would get married. They went to the Hungarian government and asked for an exit visa, refused. What they needed was a useful idiot, der Geist der Stets Beat, and she, she met me on that train. It was not a good moment in my existence. Someone said that you can only do Central Europe if you are very young or very old, and I was getting beyond my first youth. I was an idiot, but useful. Could I hire a Carmen Gear and we would squeeze Tibor into the boot? There was a twist. It would not be the Austro-Hungarian border, but the Czechoslovak. So they arrive at the Slovak-Austrian frontier. It was clear to one and all that this was not on. <laughs> the car was absurdly small, the frontier obstacle serious. None of us had quite the courage to say that this was preposterous. Tibor lay down in the back and Andrea put a coat over him. She then sat upon him <laughs> and rehearsed a line to the effect that she was suffering from an inflammation of the ovaries, Eierstockentzündung, which she thought would defeat the Slovak frontier guards. <laughs> we then approached the frontier. It was the Ides of March, 1964. Of course, it doesn't work and they're arrested. The Czech Ministry of Justice people in Prague were pigs, insisted on rules, and so we were stuck. A police car took Jan, the hapless Australian woman he'd persuaded to do the driving, and me to the prison. We stopped on the way at a cafe and they gave us an enormous Slivovica. Then the prison gates opened. Norman uh, survived, he recalls, by reciting the St. Matthew Passion, which somehow I knew by heart, Ben ich einmal soll scheiden, so scheid du nicht von mir, in the old Klemperer version. <laughs> I thought of my poor old mother, a war widow, with me as the only child. My father had been killed in the RAF in 42, and what she must be feeling. Your first week in prison is awful. I'm sure many of you have had this experience. <laughs> And the chap they had moved in with me was very sympathetic as I wiped away the tears that were not entirely to be stifled. He was quite an interesting lad, Cornell Karpaski by name. Our common language was Hungarian. The authorities let me have the grammar book I'd arrived with, and I had reached lesson 10, where they explained that the verb changes according to whether it's transitive or intransitive followed, followed by an indirect article or a dative. The translation passages were about a Palestinian going round a textile factory. <laughs> Cornell 
who was not, I think, entirely balanced in mind, must have been that phenomenon of communist prisons that everyone knows, a spitzel, someone planted to find out what you were about. He didn't get anything much out of me and must have got quite sick of the St. Matthew. I also knew the Verdi Requiem. <laughs> At some stage, he must have been told to try a homosexual approach. The prison pants came down and a foot-long pan-slav number stretched before my eyes. <laughs> On it had been tattooed the badge of fascist Slovakia, some sort of double-headed lobster. <laughs> I expressed no interest, and there we were. <laughs> the weeks went by. The food was some sort of stew pushed through a flap. Later on, one of the judges asked me, why did you never complain about the food? And I said, not to his enlightenment, have you ever lived in a Cambridge college? <laughs> The Slovak interior minister arranged for me to visit my old cell, number 283, in 1992, and I marched up the prison steps, remembering those lines. Wenn ich einmal soll scheiden, so scheid du nicht von mir. I was very near tears. I still do not know what it was about. Central Europe. But I did my stuff for the growth of Slovakia, and that has turned out quite well. <laughs> my father was a life enhancer, a whirlwind of energy and entertainment. His presence was a pick-me-up. When he called from the airport to say he was on his way home, the mood in the room would change. As he puffed and imbibed his way towards 80, I sometimes wondered if he was immortal he seemed to owe his longevity to the rejuvenating power of bad habits. My father wanted to leave his body to science, and it had certainly taken a battering. Once, while in Russia filming a documentary, he and his camera crew cleaned out the minibar. Desperate for more booze, my father searched the hotel room and finally found a small bottle. Look, he said, I've got something. He opened it and down the contents. The cameraman put his head in his hands. Oh no, he just drank my contact lenses. <laughs> <laughs> he had a childlike personality, both innocent and mischievous, and like his mother Mary, lacked any real malice. Children adored him and he was a magical father. His former student and writer, Robert McCrum, recently described him to me as a Peter Pan, the boy who never grew up, noting that J.M. Barry, Peter's creator, was a Scot like my father. And indeed, I was struck how Scottish he remained. Despite living abroad for decades, he never lost his accent. His bookshelves were stocked with Macaulay, Smith, Hume and the rest, and he even kept a well-thumbed Scots thesaurus. He frequently talked to me in Scots. Dree, which means boar, was one of his favourites, along with Jesse, weakling. He described himself, as we heard, as a goofy Enlightenment optimist, and there was a touch of the Panglossian about him. The stereotype of the gloomy, dyspeptic old Tory did not apply to him at all. His conservatism was Thatcherite, subversive, liberal, upbeat. It was a politics of emancipation. He adored Mrs. Thatcher precisely because she was unconventional and disliked Edward Heath, who, he once wrote, had the face of an angry baby. <laughs> His Euroscepticism, which I saw, assure you never wavered, was born out of libertarianism, not xenophobia. It was very Calvinist, all about self-government. And indeed, there was a Protestant austerity to my father. He was quite devout, attending church even when that meant standing side by side with tambourine-bashing evangelicals. He had a phenomenal work ethic, which led him to spend hours at his desk when duty called. His ability to speak so many languages did not come about automatically, but resulted from diligent effort. The pedantry of the scholar was alive and well in him. He was not all sweetness and light. There was a morose side, which usually came out when he gave up drinking. <laughs> 
<laughs> the loss of his father in the war left him with a deep sadness that was always there in the background. He treated his own students like a family, tirelessly promoting them as if he had to be the father to them that he'd never had himself. He was not always easy to live with and had serious flaws. He could be grandly, spectacularly irresponsible. He was often impulsive and impatient. As he himself said, he had the willpower of a prawn in a tsunami. Indeed, his attempts to give up smoking were invariably shambolic. One of these involved a calamitous stay at the Champneys Health Spa, <laughs> from which, after a week supposedly drinking carrot juice, he returned in a state of crazed inebriation. <laughs> I tried to console him years later by noting that he'd lasted much longer in Champneys than Paul Gascoigne, who was stretched out within hours of his arrival. <laughs> There was a wildness to my father's character. He was one of those buccaneering Scots who once upon a time would have joined the East India Company, learned the local languages, and ended up with gout and venereal disease. That he did, in fact, contract gout, uh, but never syphilis, as far as I know. His love of adventure landed him in a communist jail, as we just heard, where he learned Hungarian while sharing a cell with a rather uncouth gentleman who had the emblem of fascist Slovakia tattooed on his manhood. Nonetheless, he valued the experience and said in later years that all writers improve enormously from being in prison. <laughs> As a Scot down south, he was an outsider who defied easy categorization. He lived most of his life as an emigre, moving to Turkey, which he adored, and then to Hungary, which fascinated him throughout his life. Conservatives are sometimes caricatured as little Englanders, but my father was a cosmopolitan who loved Europe, France in particular, and spoke the continental languages. Despite a deep attachment to this country, he moaned about modern Britain, particularly the tendency of people to speak on mobile phones in public. One evening, we took the bus to London for a party. He always took the bus, even for the long ride between Ankara and Istanbul, where he'd somehow found a double-decker bus which had a smoking bar on the ground floor. <laughs> But you can't smoke on British buses, so he came prepared with nicotine gum and a plastic Nicorette inhalator, which he kept in his mouth like a baby's dummy, all for one agonizing hour without a cigarette. While most of us had long ago graduated to iPods, he carried a compact disc player with huge plastic headphones which blasted out clattering piano music while he read a Turkish history book, in Turkish, of course. As we got going, squeezed into the back of this wretched bus, music blaring out and my father sucking on his nicorettes as he leafed through his book, a girl in front of us started talking on her phone. My father, unaware that the music on his headphones made him shout, leant forward through the crack in the seats and bellowed in the poor girl's face, why don't you shut up and read a book? <laughs> But he was no snob. He loved thrillers and Hollywood films. In the afternoon, it was Balzac or Racine. But after dinner, it was Harrison Ford and Steven Seagal. He adored James Bond, although it wasn't really violent enough. Clint Eastwood likewise, whose films he found to be too slow. Jurassic Park, however, was superb. <laughs> <laughs> And a great favorite in later years was the mindless shoot 'em up Taken, in which Liam Neeson hunts down a bunch of Albanian pimps. <laughs> Conservatives are supposed to respect authority, but my father was a rebel and would have appreciated the fact that today is the anniversary of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. He found institutions confining and grumbled about British universities, which he felt sometimes punished talent and rewarded mediocrity. He liked giving the example of the great essayist, Thomas Carlyle, who applied for a position at St. Andrews University with a reference from Goethe, the legendary German poet, only to be rejected. <laughs> As a hard-drinking Glaswegian, he didn't really fit in on the modern campus, where the academics, as he put it, ate vegetables and peddled around. 
He shared the views of his hero, Edward Gibbon, who wrote of the Oxford Dons that their conversation stagnated in a round of college business, Tory politics, personal anecdotes, and private scandal. Their dull and deep potations excuse the brisk intemperance of youth, and their constitutional toasts were not expressive of the most lively loyalty for the House of Hanover. Now, my father's potations were never dull, but they were admittedly deep. When we were moving out of our house in Oxford some years ago, I unearthed a half-empty bottle of scotch in one of the cupboards in his study, coated in dust and cobwebs. He said sheepishly that he'd stashed it away years ago from my poor, long-suffering mother and took it out occasionally to nourish students like Dominic Cummings. So all those complaining about the Prime Minister's special advisor know where to point the finger. When my father died, I received a message from a friend in St. Petersburg that could only have come from a Russian. Dear Rupi, it said, I have just heard sad news that Norman has entered the kingdom of heaven. And for all his many flaws, there was something angelic about my father. And how better to say farewell to this lovely and unusual man than to head downstairs and raise a glass in his honor. O thou who art the light of the minds that know thee, the life of the souls that love thee, and the strength of the wills that serve thee, help us so to know thee 
that we may truly love thee, so to love thee that we may truly serve thee, whom to serve is perfect freedom. Grant us, Lord, the wisdom and the grace to use aright the time that is left to us on earth. Lead us to repent of our sins, the evil we have done and the good we have not done, and strengthen us to follow the steps of your Son in the way that leads to the fullness of eternal life. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I think it was Lord David Cecil saying every genius mm. has enormous faults. Would you see yourself as having great faults? What would you think of me if I said no? No, no, no. <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I've ever asked it before. <laughs> I don't know what I'd think of you. I don't do my piano practice. I'm a little bit relaxed about learning Turkish. And you smoke. <laughs> and I smoke. <laughs>
when your hearts are broken. May the broken heart of God the Father enfold you. When your hands are weary, may the pierced hands of God the Son embrace you. When your soul is heavy, may the renewing life of God the Holy Spirit revive you, so that you may know that with God you never walk alone. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>